Greetings to all of you. I'm not really an expert on technology, but on labor, on labor relations, and uh, we have dedicated this last year to study the question of automation and impact on labor relations. Um, but first of all, let me tell you that I'm, I'm really proud to be here because as labor historian, I've been teaching the strike that took place here in 1934. And so this is a very special place uh, for me to remember uh, what has happened in those days. And I've been following dock workers' uh, actions and dock workers' struggles in the last 10 years or 20 years since the Liverpool dockers' strike. And of course, your union represents, still today, it is a big example of a combative union and a union that supports international struggles. So it's a great pleasure to be here with you. Um, I want to tell you a little bit of what we know today about automation and the impact in workers. And I have to tell you uh, some example of what can be done concerning this. And also, I bring... Uh, sorry that sometime I, I will stop because I've been flying for 17 hours or something like that directly here. So my English will not be good and sometimes I stop. But hopefully you will not fall asleep, I will take care of this. The, the Dock Workers Union that I, with, uh, I embrace, I call it my union as well, uh, that supported together with your union my travel here. They also uh, want me to bring back to Portugal the idea of a labor fest supported by the Dockers Union. So I also want to tell you this and I already talk with Steve in order we can bring the best practice of you here concerning this. So what we know about automation? Well, we know, we don't know much about automation. We know that there is a huge technological development, really big, and that is possible nowadays. When we speak about automation, it's not the same as about uh, other kinds of technology or uh, that started with machinery and other kinds in the 19th century or 20th century. Automation is about, there is no human intervention. So it's different. Automation means that in that place, there is no human intervention. Of course, we know there is human intervention behind uh, in uh, IT sector, in communication sector, in engineer sector. It's estimated that 47% of workers could be directly or indirectly. Uh, there is machines to do a diagnostic, a full diagnostic without the intervention of doctors. Uh, we are speaking also about artificial intelligence. Uh, we are speaking about, for example, uh, if you go to Google Translator, you do a translation without the intervention of a translator directly. Of course, now the translation is not so good, but there is enough knowledge that become, this translation becomes a good translation. So we are speaking really on uh, major change. I don't like to use revolution because revolution is something very serious and uh, good <laughs> to be used uh, in this case, but there is a huge change in, uh, in the working places. There are, so we cannot say that uh, how many jobs will vanish. Nobody can say this today. Even the calculation from McKenzie Institutes or others cannot be taken into account because we don't know how many jobs are created in uh, communication, engineer, electronics, robotics, universities to teach to all of this. So, we guess that will happen is that the majority of the jobs lose it will be, in fact, jobs less qualified. And dockers are extremely threatened by automation, especially because we are in San Francisco. Why I'm saying this? Because automation is so expensive that at this moment and in the next years, will be a reality 
in rich countries. This is being done in, or will be done, in Rotterdam, in big ports in Australia and the US. Of course, Spain, so we are speaking in countries where the level of salaries compensates, and I will say this, labor for me is a, a right as important as uh, life, so compensates from the point of view of profit. It's, it doesn't compensate from the point of view of society to dismiss the workers. Second on the question of automation is that highly possible that automation is being done in countries where there is some kind of public subsidize. It's quite difficult to know exactly this because these subsidize, sometimes they are not direct subsidized. But for example, you get reduction on payment of taxes in your company if you restrict the port. Uh, you get um, subsidized because uh, you are going to train uh, new engineers. All of these, so there are dozens and probably hundreds of ways to subsidize automation, to make it cheaper for the companies. Because automation is really expensive, really expensive. It takes more than a decade to get the money back if you fully automated, fully automated uh, port. It takes more than a decade. The way to bring these costs low, it, it's to, to give them back to the society through subsidize to the companies by these uh, different schemes I'm uh, referring. The third thing about automation is that um, it will not avoid capitalist crisis. By the contrary, it will increase capitalist crisis. Because the question of capitalist strikes crisis has to do with the amount of money you spend on fixed capital. So any company has fixed capital, variable capital. Variable capital are workers where you can get profit. Fixed capital is money that you spend already. It's, in a, it's a cost. So the problem uh, for, from the point of view of capital, uh, if in the beginning uh, fully automated ports can bring more profit, within the time it will end up with a decrease of rate of profit. Why? Because you have no workers to, have, to, to bring the profit back. It's work that produce profit. It's work that produce value in our society, in a capital society. I, I, this is something in an abstraction that maybe it's difficult to understand, but let me tell you like this. If the richest man in the world has all the money you can imagine, and he puts all the money in a technology and automated uh, development, whatever, if he has at least if he has no workers, there is no way he, he will he, sorry he can expand value because the money was all spent in something that is a cost from the point of view of capital. Labor can produce value. It doesn't happen the same with uh, isolated technology. It doesn't matter how big and how perfect it is. So let's imagine a scientific situation that will not happen because before of that, of course, we have social revolutions and huge uprisings because we cannot have humanity starving in large scale in central countries. Unfortunately, we can have humanity starving in very poor agrarian countries like sub-Saharan Africa. You cannot have this in central core countries because the working class and the middle sectors do not accept. But if we have, if we have, let's say, a scientific uh, uh, scene, like the economist Michael Roberts refer, speaking about robots, he says, if we have no workers, just machines, we will have infinite productivity and zero profit. Infinite productivity and zero profit. That is 
the situation. So, why we have faced 2008 huge crisis is, of course, not because that the the working class in America has to have a mortgage to pay a huge uh, amount of money house to live. This is not, of course, the problem. The problem would be at the first uh, uh, that the salaries are not enough to pay a house and people have to buy money to the bank. But even that, that was not the situation. The situation, the biggest, the crisis, this was just the symptom. The crisis has started in the industrial production in the US. Why? Because of this. Because the huge development of technology in the last 20 years made the companies to reach a moment where they put all the money in technology, they have increased productivity, they have increased production. We have never produced as much as we do nowadays. As less workers they have, less as less work as they have, as more fixed capital, constant capital, technology you have, more costs you have, and the rate of profit will fall down. That was hap that what has happened in 2007, 2008. And of course, when it fell down, this has a huge impact in the banks because the banks, the banks finance this. There is a connection between industrial capital and financial capital through this situation. So, if we have, for example, a decade of uh, dramatic development of technology in the next years. What we'll have is a bigger crisis than we had in 2008. That's what we have. Except, and I want to talk with you a little bit about this. If we have the machines, the automated cranes, and we divide the work that exists in the port by all workers. Then we have the perfect situation. But that's socialism. <laughs> because there will be no profit in this situation. We have machines. We have automated cranes. In the sectors where hard work can be done by machines. This is very good for humanity. And we pick up the, uh, how many longshore workers we have, how many stevedores there is here in the bay? 1,400. 1,400. We divide this uh, worker by the hours that have to be worked. And what will happen? Well, it will happen that these people will produce the same, but they will do it in two or three hours and they will contribute to social security, everybody will pay for social security, everybody will have time for life. Life is not just about uh, working, working, working and paying, paying a uh, house, a mortgage, food, etc. Life is about creativity, life is about art, life is about to have time. This is what will happen if we divide the working time hours. What a utopian idea. And I ask you, we have cut the working time hours to half in 50 years in the 19th century. How we can't do it in 100 years in the 20th century? When the productivity has raised, I don't know in the United States, but the United States has the biggest productivity in the world. In Portugal, the productivity has raised five times since the 60s. One work now, one worker now, does the same as five workers used to do 50 years ago. What has happened to this money? You know what has happened to this money better than I. There is 1% of the people in the world who have half percent of the richness in the world. But in this 1%, People in the middle class that have a house in London or in Paris are there. If you, if you go to see the 0.001%, then you will see that they have the majority of the wealth in the world. When I was in the IDC uh, conference in Miami, I said, doctors can uh, raise this flag as it was the flag of the International Workers' Association 150 years ago. I was reading the texts of foundation of the International Association of Workers 150 years ago. 
Do you know what is written there? Basic things. People should work less. People should have time for family. Shall have time. Why there is just people doing manual work and very smart, intelligent people that can study. Why everybody shouldn't study, shouldn't have time to learn. Why we have this division between manual and intellectual work. There is more there. Why people work at night? I love this one. Why people work at night? Because I come from a country that did the Carnation Revolution against the dictatorship in 1974. And the bakers did a demonstration. Uh, not one, several, and strikes. We are not going to cook bread at night because we want to sleep with our wives. <laughs> There was a flag, there was a pamphlet, a huge one, in front of the demonstration. And the word was, we want to sleep with our wives. And they sing this in Lisbon. And you know what? I think they are right. I think they are absolutely right. I think it's ridiculous, ridiculous, that we live in the 21st century And I can go to a shopping mall and there is people there at 11 in the night selling water, selling shirts. Do I have to buy a shirt at 11 in the night and someone has no life because I want to buy a shirt at 11 in the night? This makes no sense. We need doctors to be in the hospital at night. Of course we need. Therefore we have to pay really good. We know in France, in the, dog, in the port of Le Havre, was made a study. And France has one of the best health system and welfare system in the world. Dog workers live less 12 years in average than the average of French uh, life expectancy. Do you know why? Because of shifts. Because there is no way you can get used to the huge uh, physical Uh, demand that is to work at night, that is to sleep in different time every day. Of course, what has happened is that unfortunately, as unions abandoned the idea of reducing working time hours, they are keeping asking, I don't know here, but I know in Europe it's dramatically, they don't have increase in wages, but they accept to work working time hours, extra working time hours all the time to have the same salary as they had 20 years ago without working working time, extra working time. But we have to say to people that they have to earn very good and work less, not work more. It doesn't make any sense. If you have to uh, uh, have a container of urgent medicines, of course we need to call a doctor and we need to pay him really good because he's killing himself because he's working at night. It's not because it's dangerous that something can fall over your head. It's because your body cannot <coughs> sustain this. But more than your body, it's about life. It's about sleeping with our wives. It's about sleeping with our husbands. It's about having time for life. And we have to make, sorry, we have to make this question. Why we have increased productivity? Why we work more and more and more? why we have huge technology, why we have greater science, and there is a huge concentration of health in a few hands. What these people can do with the money they have? I mean, Bill Gates can live 1,000 years. He cannot spend his money. It makes no sense. It's not about money. It's about power. It's about power. It's an irrational system that is killing people through working conditions that are not acceptable. It's not acceptable that you are here, listen to me, afraid of losing your job, afraid of not losing, having uh, money to pay for a decent education and help to your children. This is absolutely irrational. We are not living in a society 2,000 years ago where people could not control nature. If there was a disease, people would die in the village because they couldn't control nature. We have, we have never discovered such beautiful 
things and technology? Why is not this serving people? Why is this uh, feeling a system that nobody... Thank you so much, then. I've, I've been... Uh, I did it, it uh, so I asked for you. Thank you, thank you very much. What can be done about this? Well, you know better than me. First of all, what can be done concerning automation has to be done now while you have a job. You have the power while you have the job. You have the power while you have the power to stop the production. After that, you don't have power. You have political power, you can vote, but you will not touch the profit. So what can be done about automation? It has to be done now. So I would say that the first thing is that you should start thinking about it now, immediately. It's not something that will happen in 100 years. And if they want to bring the port from Lisbon to the south, to the other bank, because they want to do real estate uh, speculation, and it's, uh, the port is in a very expensive area. Do you know when I was a little, I used to tell to my mother and father, they are forest engineers, that I found the port very ugly. Why they don't put a garden in the place of the port? That was when I was 14 or 15 years old. It's, it's the, the politicians with 50 years old in Portugal, they, they have the same uh, thought as I had with 14 years old. So you can uh, forgive me because I was a child. You cannot forgive them. A port is specially under globalization where all essential goods for life reach place. So having the port there is not by chance. If you are moving it 30 kilometers away, you have to pay the costs of this. And the costs are huge. Because, of course, the costs are not huge. Because usually it's the public that supports the costs and it's the private that has the concession of the port. Otherwise they wouldn't move the port because it's such a difficult thing to build a port. So, port is something very important. And in Lisbon, they want to cut the jobs, they cut the salaries of dockers. They say they are privileged workers, workers are aristocracy and other kinds of things. You know, it's incredible because we live in a society where more and more and more managements earn millions to do what? And when a worker has money enough to go on holidays once a year, he belongs to the labor aristocracy. It's immediately. It's, uh, it's. And they had, now by, by memory, uh, 57, I believe, uh, precarious workers. And these precarious workers were dismissed. And they, the fixed workers, did a strike in order they were readmitted. I learned a lot with the dockers in Portugal. I learned a lot as a labor historian. Of course, now that I read to read the International Workers Association uh, uh, speeches, I learned that was all there 150 years ago. <laughs> But when I start following the dockers in Lisbon, I was astonished with the things they do. The first thing they do, they, had a, they have a fund, a solidarity fund. This fund started, as most of the funds in labor history, because the widows do not have money to pay to bury their men after a labor accident. So this is the beginning of solidarity fund, can you imagine? This fund in Portugal started in the same way, started to help the widows. And they pick up this fund, and they pick up the dismissed precarious workers and told them, you don't accept to work, and we support you during these months of strike. This is basic. This is absolutely the minimum you can do. 
But it was the first time in my life I saw this. I read it in some, you know, in some books that I teach to my students, but it was the first time in my life I saw the fixed workers pick up money and instead of doing a moral struggle made of ideas, they made it with action and reality. They pick up the, the precarious workers and they said, of course you have to accept work, you have a family to feed, but you, in order you don't do it, we are going to help you. This is unity. I keep hearing unions speaking about unity, but it's just a word. This is not a word. This is real struggle. Do you know what happened? They won. They won. After three years of successive struggles, I will make the story short now. The last strike was 38 days. Women took place. They found a movement to support them. And they won. And uh, I think last month was signed uh, the last uh, nine contracts of the dismissed precarious workers. Why I'm telling you this story? Because in a peripheral country, under Troika intervention, uh, with the huge job cuts, there is a real unemployment uh, rate of unemployment of 15, 17% now. A group of dockers could make the difference. And they could make the difference because they realize how, how we are going to be strong. And how we are going to be strong is not about saying good words. I'm sorry, but it's not about saying good words. The second thing that they have done was that they went to speak with social movements. I think this was very important. I, I believe very much in the industrial working class. So I'm here, as you know, this is not fashion. Nowadays, fashion is to believe in social movements, all kinds of social movements. But I believe that the industrial working class has more power. I believe, no, I'm positive sure about this. Because if you do a demonstration, it doesn't matter what sector, you can have political impact. But if you stop production, you have immediate impact on capital accumulation. This is a difference that nobody can change. But I think there are important social movements, new social movements. And I think it's a big mistake to be cooperative. Sooner or later you will be alone if you are cooperative. And were the dockers in Portugal that went out of the union to the social movements demonstration, to students, to a kind of occupy that was in Lisbon, and went to them and said, we want to give our solidarity to you, and we want your solidarity. So I think this is a, another thing uh, I learned with the dockers in Lisbon, that I, I, I want to, to give you this message today. It's about internationalism. They, they have International Dock Workers Council, which you have as a, the union, your union is affiliated. This was very important. Why? I, I have to say this, and this is true. In 2008, capitalism ended, as you know. The biggest bank in the world, the Bank of America, and the biggest company in the world, the GM, were bankrupt. And virtually, all companies and banks in the world were bankrupt. And the capital that was for 20 years explaining to stupid workers how private entrepreneurship was so good, went to the stupid <coughs> workers and asked for their money to save their private companies. This is what saved capitalism for a 1929 crisis. Was a huge amount of money, it's trillions of dollars. So I'm in the place where this happened more, but it happened in Germany, it happened in England, it happened in Portugal, it happened in France, happened everywhere. And you know what has happened after 2008? All the bankers had dinner together and said, we have to do something. We need money. The biggest companies went together in parties, in dinners, in clubs, whatever, in their organizations. They are very well organized. 
and say we have to do something. Do you know what workers have done? Very few. In fact, almost nothing. Especially the industrial workers in the rich countries. And I, I really believe in these industrial workers in rich countries. <laughs> I really believe that the German working class automobile industry has a role in history in the future. That the industrial working class in the US has a role to play. But they didn't, they didn't do what they should have done. Except, I think, one sector that did, as far as I know, the only strike, the only international strike after 2008 was a very short strike in a one single sector. It was not, it was a drop of what the working class should have done in 2008. But it was done by the dockers. The only international strike that took place in the world after 2008 crisis was done by IDC. It was a two-hour strike done in 2013. They called for a world stoppage in solidarity with the Portuguese workers against the dismiss in the port of Lisbon. And this had very big impact. Why? In fact, it had such a big impact that after the strike, the bosses said they want to negotiate in the day after. Although they were in struggle for four years, it was after this strike that they said this. Why? Because globalization has brought some terrible things to workers, as you know, especially social dumping. You are permanently threat to be dismissed because someone from a cheaper country will come and get your job, or the company goes to a cheaper country and get the job. This is what we hear in the last 20 years. And this is globalization from the point of view of, from the point of view of rich countries that of course control capital and production throughout the world. But I think this, uh, the strength of companies which is using social dumping can be their weakest, weakest uh, point, can be the link where they broke. Why? Because we, we live in an economy of just-in-time production. Why you are working 24 hours a day in your port? Because companies don't want to have stocks. So they are keep, keep uh, bringing commodities every second, every second, all the companies in the world are asking for commodities. This means that when you do a strike in a port, you stop virtually hundreds or maybe thousands of companies around the world. And that is the huge uh, potential strength of dockers and transport workers in general nowadays, is that if you do a strike 150 years ago, you would stop your company, not more than that. And nowadays, if you do a strike, you can stop thousands of companies. If you think with me the potential of this, it's huge. It means, for example, that you can do a strike with uh, almost no, no, not spending money. Do you know why, how? I tell you, you can contract me as dog workers to <laughs> uh, I tell you. Imagine, you do a strike here, and you ask for your brothers around the world to give a little fee to support your strike. For them, will be nothing. They will continue working and get salary. And they will give one dollar, doesn't matter. They are 100,000 in IDC. One dollar to pay your salary. You can be on strike for three months. This is the beautiful of internationalism nowadays. It's, it's, but how workers do not see this? 
If you go to a hospital, you can stop a hospital in a strike just stopping the one sector. If you stop, for example, the surgery sector, and all people in the hospital give money to the surgery sector, it's much cheaper to do strike and you can stop the entire section. This is about socialization of production. It's about using this, what was used against workers for 20 years, which is social dumping, can be used now to give workers rights all around the world. And this would be, I think, my last remarks. But before I go there, I want to say some other things to the union, if you allow me. <coughs> Uh, the right to work is the same as a, the right to live. For example, when we live in ancient societies, we go fishing, we go to uh, pick up berries or hunting. This gives us the chance to be alive. In capitalist societies, if you don't work, you don't have a chance to be alive. So. The right to vote or the political rights cannot be more important than the social rights. And the, among the social rights, the basic one is the right to work. I'm saying this because the right to work is not the same as living from social assistance. And I think this has been a major mistake of unions in the last decades. Is that people are dismissed and they go for back for money to social assistance. And this is the right to work, the, to work is not just about working and living, it's also about dignity. People have the right to work and live from their work and not live begging from the state or social assistance or charity of anyone. This makes no sense. Uh, uh, it destroys people's life because it destroys people's mind, because people feel bad to live from not working. And I think they are right to feel bad from leave from not working. And I know that there are lots of unions that are against it, I would tell you. I didn't travel 17 hours to <laughs> this. <laughs> the point is that work is a duty. It's not just a right, it's a duty. Except if you are a child, if you are old, or if you don't have health. In these cases, we should pay for these people very good, not charity, not the minimum. If you don't have health, we have the obligation as human beings to pay very good for these people, disability and health, etc. But all the other ones, they have to work collectively to the production of society. That's what makes us part of humankind. That's what makes us creative persons. That's what makes work organize our lives, also our social lives, also our families. So the idea that no problem, we put this, we put here a fully automated crane, and then you can go to uh, ONG and ask for help, or this, this is not about living. This is not a decent life. It cannot be like this. Second, if you are not working, you are not sustaining through taxes the social security system. That's why it's being bankrupt. It's not because people are old. It's great people are getting old. It means that we have enough scientific development for people going old. It's because there are not enough people uh, paying for social security because people are not working or are living from social security instead of paying to social security. Uh, the right to work is also, again, the right to not work. This means that after the work, you have to have time, and time means energy, to enjoy life. So people cannot work 8, 10, 12, 14 hours. This doesn't make nowadays any sense. We are obliged to produce as a society the maximum of production with the minimum of resources. And the only way to do this with is with full employment. We have to have the work that exists 
divided by everyone. Work in our societies, unemployment in our societies is the way you regulate the price of the labor force. That's why are people unemployed. Why are people, why are people unemployed? Why? Why I go out and are people that are doing, because we don't need them to work? I need, I can, I, I work 12 or 14 hours a day, every day. I can divide my work with another four teachers and researchers. This makes no sense but it makes a sense from the point of view of capital accumulation because the only way to regulate, there are two ways to regulate labor force. Through dictatorships, you forbidden unions and political parties and this has happened in my country, 48 years of dictatorship has forbidden unions and political parties guaranteeing a low price of the labor force. The second one is through unemployment. If you have a huge number of unemployed labor force you are keeping the salaries of the ones that are working down. This is the role of unemployment in our society. So the question of controlling unemployment for the people that are working is controlling labor factors. It's absolutely essential if you want to keep your job and your salary to fight unemployment. Because unemployment is outside and people need to work, they need to live. So we'll, they will accept to work for less. Not because they are terrible people. They are, of course, there, are, there is always a voluntary, revolutionary people that can handle everything. But we, we are not morally entitled to ask someone who has a child that he cannot accept to work for less because you want to keep your job. You have the obligation to work for him in order he comes to work with you. It's the opposite, because you are stronger. You have the job. It doesn't. So we cannot change the roles here. I think this is also very important. My last remark about this is about demands. I've been seeing unions, I, I'm for the second time in the United States with this union, I just read on the 30 strike, so I don't know about your union and I think it's different. But I've seen too much unions and was not the case in Lisbon as well, fortunately, ask for uh, the minimum. Ask for the minimum. So for example, have you heard, the? Po sometimes you hear in the statistics in the US, the poverty line. Do you know what is the poverty line? The poverty, well, usually it's one dollar a day or something like that. Or two dollars now, I'm not sure. But the poverty line is uh, in, a, in a majority of the countries associated with the minimum, uh, with the average wage. It means that if the average wage comes down, the poverty line comes down as well. So, for example, Portugal now has more poor people, but less statistically poor people because the average wage has gone down. So, supposedly, the number of poor people, according to this statistic, has come down as well. <laughs> It's uh, how, how you do things. Uh, the, we have been dealing with the poverty line of United Na Nations. Do you know what is? What does that mean? It means that people are fit to be alive. This is not our notion of poverty. It cannot be our notion of poverty. Our kids must learn music. If they don't, they are poor. That, that, that would be my poverty line. Our kids must have a very good health. If they don't, they are poor. Our kids must have the best of education for all. If they don't, they are poor. Unions cannot demand the minimum all the time. Because the minimum, the minimum, the minimum. And suddenly, we are demanding the minimum wage, which is uh, astonishingly indignant. Do you understand my point? Even to mobilize workers. If I would be a worker in my union, ask for something like, you know, 1% of increasing wages, I don't want that for my life. I want much more from, from life. 
And this is absolutely essential, that the demands of the workers, that you can dream high, that you can dream high. Once there was a lady in the Portuguese Revolution in a movie, I think the movie was done by Robert, Robert Kramer here from US. He went to see the Portuguese Revolution in 74 in Portugal. I think the, this part of the movie is from her. She's a very poor woman with no teeth. She's really a poor woman. She has no money to have teeth. Tooth. You say tooth? Teeth. Teeth. Very, very poor. And she says, uh, my, uh, my kid, he doesn't have a bicycle, and I want to buy him a bicycle, because the other kids have a bicycle. And I, I'm asking here why the other kids can say, I'm going to be an engineer, and my kid cannot say this. I want for him the same as for the other ones. And I think this is very important, that workers do not learn to live with less. Your dreams are not less than the other's dreams. So, it's very important that unions incorporate this. With uh, the question of organization, if you respect rank and fly workers, if you take part in union, if you have discipline, because struggle is about discipline. It's really a lot about discipline. I know there are some postmodern ideas now that says that everybody do whatever they want. Well, if you do whatever you want, you don't need to be in a union, you don't need a collective agreement, you don't, it's not like that life. Life. We need discipline and we need organization. And we need leaders, we need good leaders. And unfortunately, we have been hearing in the last years that industrial workers should not have any contact with intellectuals or leaders. Uh, there is a way to depoliticize unions. But we need to control labor. I'm going to explain this in order you don't be scared. We, we, can, we need to produce well when we do things. This cannot be, we are, should be the first ones in our work to be perfect, to do the things correctly. But our, our and that's what I think a union can teach to management in capitalism, is that you have two ways of controlling labor. One is that you have a powerful management that does moral harassment, disciplinary process, uh, uh, fear, uses fear to control work. This is not our way to, to live. The other one is democratic control of work. Is that we have meetings face to face and we decide what to do and we ask each other responsibilities. Is that when, when we elect our leaders, we ask them for responsibilities. And we can dismiss them if they didn't follow our democratic decisions. But this is also about control. It's childish to think that we can live a society where there is no control. The question is that if we have a top and down control or if we have a down top control. And that's what the union has, this one, has a lot to teach to society. You have a lot to teach concerning order to the capitalism chaos that we are living in the production nowadays. You can pick up the example that you live in your union when you face to face debate, when you look to each other, when you take decisions, and take this to the production and change this idea that workers cannot control production. Workers can control production and they can learn how to control the production and they can do it through democracy and not through fear. And this is why I believe so much in the dock workers and the industrial working class. And I think you have this role in your hands because you are in a rich country, in a rich city. And uh, capitalism in rich countries, I come from Europe as well, they are not afraid anymore. Do you know why? Because there is no revolutions anymore. 
all the rights that were conquered in the 20th century were either by revolutions or fear of revolutions. Here in the US, they were done by the 30 strikes, the sit down strikes of GM, the longshore strikes, the seamstress strikes. That's what have done, what have led to huge labor rights in the US. In 1945, Europe, the workers were armed. The dock workers, do you know how has born the national dockers scheme in England? It was born in a wildcat strike done by dock workers in 1945 against the union, who said that was illegal. The union said it was an anti-patriotic strike of the dock workers. And they have done it, illegal, anti-patriotic. And they have defined a national labor scheme that didn't allow, that finished with casual work in England in 1945. In 1989, the union didn't fight, and they lose it because the union didn't fight. And what the Liverpool show, the Liverpool strike of Dockers show, it, uh, it was the first international strike against neoliberalism. What Liverpool showed that the leaders of Portugal have learned and brought to Lisbon 15 years after was that fixed workers have a responsibility to casual workers and that unity can change the situation. And if you can change your local situation, you also can play also a role in changing the world. And the things are going to be worse. Not because of fully automated cranes. Also because of that. But because of, imagine what will happen in the next cyclical crisis. It's on, in the corner. It's in the corner. Do you know what these guys that rule the world have to offer? Trump, that's what they have to offer. On the other side, they have Merkel. They have nationalism and protectionism, and they have liberalism and flexibilization of working hours in, uh, of life. We have another world to show them, a world of democracy, of order, of discipline, of protection, and of time to live. So you have this role in your hands. Thank you so much.